Uh, hey guys, Christian here with Uncharted. Got three of my good friends with to talk a little bit about winter safety uh, as we are trying to support people getting out and kind of having their own personal adventures. So on the right here, Billy DeMong. Um, I think I said one of the previews, kind of one of my adventure buddies here. We get into some sketchy adventures occasionally. <laughs> Safely though. Uh, and then safe, yeah, we're still here. Uh, Billy's an Olympic gold medalist in order combined. A father, I know you transitioned to snowmobiles a lot now, so mm -hmm. snowmobile, ski, cross country, doing all that kind of stuff. So thanks for coming. Uh, we've got Kaylin Thorian here. Kaylin, I, I don't, you have a home, right? Because mostly sure. what I see is <laughs> you are like always in a tent or on a motorcycle. A little uh, vagabond. Or in the mountains. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm jealous of you every day. But I think uh, the best way to know something is just to live it. I'd say you do that as much as anybody I know. So thank you for coming. Thanks. Excited about your perspective. And Craig Gordon here, which is, he's one of the Utah Avalanche Center uh, forecasters. And as long as he'll keep me around. Yeah, <laughs> you're kind of like Mr. Avalanche around here. Everybody's like the guy with the butt. I'm like, that's the guy. That's the so guy, yeah. You're out there yeah. every day too. And you probably know more about snowpack than the rest of Utah combined. So uh, it's I a thought good this place is a to be. good combination here. <laughs> yeah, stay on top yeah. of it. So I guess to start, you guys, um, I have a bunch of questions here I've typed up, and I just want this to be conversational. But when did when did this all start for you? I think everybody probably starts on a resort with their parents on a chairlift. Not you, Billy. I mean, so there you go. Like, how did how did you guys get into who you are today? Like, what drew you? <laughs> I mean, honestly, like I grew up Nordic skiing, right? So five years old. Here's your skis, chase the kids, whoever wins gets a lollipop. <laughs> and by uh, nine years old, we were like way into the Adirondack Mountain backcountry. And at the time, it was like straight cut 205 double camber, you know, uh, tele skis with three pin bindings and cables, low back leather boots. And we were like assaulting these, you know, shoots. In the, in the Adirondacks. And one thing we did not have to worry about at all, basically, there was avalanches. You know, I think in my entire life, one, one avalanche has happened that's and why didn't somebody. you have to worry about it? Just the snowpack there is totally different. It's very high moisture content. Very, it sets up very hard. Um, you know, most of the time, you're mostly just trying not to slide off something on ice. So you right. have a lot of other things. The elements in particular, you know, you get sweaty, you die of cold. You can, you know, hit a tree. There's a lot of different features that are also dangerous, but avalanches were nothing on my radar growing up. And a lot of what I did growing up was just like trying to figure out how to use this really old school to, you know, nowadays, but at the time, the cutting edge telemark backcountry equipment and trying to navigate that as like a 70 pound nine year old, you know, down these huge chutes in the East. So to me, like moving out West 25, 30 years ago, was a whole different scope. Like all of a sudden the snow is much more forgiving for skiing. I felt like a hero with plastic boots and, you know, like all the new gear. But at the same point, there's a whole different uh, spectrum of challenges and dangers out here that I had to learn to navigate. And in some regards, early in life, got lucky to have made it through some of the things I did. But I feel like now I've got the knowledge base. I think that's one of the things we talked about kind of before we start is uh, we all have different experiences. and. Right. At the same point, like there's no perfect answer, but there's a lot of right and wrong answers in the equation that goes into the backcountry. True. Totally mm -hmm. true. And it's not just avalanches. There's a lot of things that can kill you out there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is avoidable, right? I mean, you started out, you are born out here, right? I uh, born in Idaho. Idaho. I started late. Um, you know, parents planted the sea, but I actually hated skiing growing up. <laughs> Absolutely hated it. And I didn't get into it until I was about 16. And... I hate to admit it, but because I was chasing a boy, I was like, oh, this guy's really cute in high school and he skis like I totally ski and <laughs> went out skiing that day and uh, ended up he went home after a while. And I was like, this is the best thing I've ever done. And I skied till last year nice. and You're forgot about skiing. him and yeah. still kept skiing. <laughs> um, but then moved out to Alta. I knew right after I graduated, I wanted to be in Utah for skiing. Like this is the place to be. So I moved out, got a job at Alta flipping burgers and Funny enough, though, I had no idea. I thought avalanches were something that happened in the Himalaya. And like, these aren't normal occurrences. And so I, I hate to admit this, Craig. I was like, I was hiking around uh, Wolverine and Rocky Point and, and all those places without 
beacon or anything just by myself. I'm like, I'm going to go out for a little sunset. Right. You no know, noodle at 18 years old and just like went out and did it. And looking back now, I'm really grateful with how lucky I got. Um, but you well, know, I think over the education time. around that has changed a lot. I yeah. mean, I think people now know that that's an inherent risk. Mm-hmm. Thanks a lot to UAC. Yeah. And that's what you guys do every day. But from Not a personal side, you've been skiing your whole life, I assume, right? I've only known yeah. you for a few years, but... <laughs> What's your background? Yeah, so I started uh, with a pair of skis on my feet at three and kind of balanced that between skiing and surfing. And, uh, you know, realized I probably couldn't make a living surfing, right? <laughs> but growing up on the East Coast, we used to do Vermont trips. So very familiar with, you know, that kind of lay of the land. But I sent myself here on a ski vacation with a local ski club in 1978. There it is. And I was like, wow, Utah, this place is pretty rad, you know? And just like you said, Billy, just like the snow is so forgiving, right? I mean, like full on Nirvana right. experience. And as I recall, a um, couple of days in a storm cycle and it is dumping and trying to figure out powder skiing was just like a remarkable, a remarkably <laughs> humbling experience, right? I thought that like for the first five of my uh, first five years of my life, just being able to suck at surfing was one thing. But like like you were just thrown into it when you learn how to powder ski. Right. And you quickly learn that like you have absolutely no friends on a powder day. I mean, right. You know, that that, that (laughs) mantra very much comes true. But I got off of the top of the old Collins lift to clear skies in the uh, in the break in a storm cycle. And I start watching some Alta patrollers mm-hmm. come across the ballroom throwing bombs. They're not triggering avalanches, but they're skiing powder. And I'm like, I'm coming back to do that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Went back, told my family that. And, you know, I was immediately like ostracized. Yeah. Right? Like, I'd always been a little bit of a different free spirit in my community, but this definitely set me apart. I came back here in the early 80s under the guise of higher education, (laughs) got a nighttime dishwashing job at Snowbird, and then, you know, thought I could sort of like balance school and skiing, and man, the skiing thing just took over. (laughs) (laughs) I dropped out of college two months in, I was like, I I gotta go back to Alta. I'm just waiting for my job to pop back up online. I was like, okay, I'm gone. (laughs) Sometimes that education thing at that level is a little overrated, right? I I just wanted to ski. (laughs) <laughs> not learning many, anything. How many days a year would you guys say you spend skiing? And then of those days, how many of them are off resort? Oof. That's a lot of math, Christian. Roughly. <laughs> you said there so, be no numbers involved in this so, when we signed up. I, I kept a training log for a long time. Oh, yeah. Here you go. So from 97, when I first moved to Steamboat, um, 2002, when I moved here, till about 2014, when I wrapped up my career, I was averaging about 100 days in the backcountry. Wow. Um, a lot of that is like, even to this day, I have a 10 year old who now backcountry skis. We probably do about 50, 50 with him. Cause it's still important to go to the resort just to get some, right. some miles, still spend a few days, you know, with the younger one, but you know, when, and if possible, I'd way rather prefer setting my own track and whether that's on a sled, you know, approach or even getting there on a sled and doing laps or, you know, what I prefer is a combination and, and skinning up, love the backcountry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very much the same way. I mean, I see you more in backcountry than in resorts, right? Yeah, typically. Especially, you know, no offense to Utah, but it's getting a little crowded at the resorts. It's a little crowded. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, no, the backcountry for sure. Um, Just to find that zen. uh, Yeah, it's a place to release. And I like to do the combo day. You know, a couple hours in the resort in the morning and then head out and go for a walk. Or get up super duper early like Craig does, and, <laughs> and just get <laughs> and after it. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How many how many days in the backcountry are you, Chris? Every day. You know, <laughs> about every day. So, but, but you know what you learn too, though, is to pick and choose those days, yeah. right? So some days you really do have to put the hammer down and get a little work done, and maybe put some guardrails on life, sure. but. Then the beauty here is our access and the ease to get into the mountains. And, you know, we were talking earlier, Billy, about kind of this this hybrid approach. And I don't know, Kaylin, are you doing the sled uh, access thing these uh, days? Now that I've moved, I'm going to be. Yes. So Idaho is all about sledding. You um, get into these yeah. rural areas, yeah. right? Yeah. And at one time, you know, coming from a, a backcountry ski perspective and especially telemark skiing. Um, and I got to ask you, Billy. So, when did the plastic boot thing start? <laughs> Is that a thing now, or what? 
<laughs> well, I've got I got my first pair of plastic boots when I moved here in '96. Nice. I still have my original Jeez. pair of T races with the faux carbon back. Oh my god! It's kind of my go-to's. Um, you know, I kind of go back and forth now. So with like the, the red T races? Oh yeah. That's what I ski in right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> like the best boot scarf I ever made, man. It might Ryan have been Kalen's you, but like... I feel like 15 years ago somebody offered me at the bottom of Millicent like <laughs> cash for the boots I was wearing. It might have been you. Like, I've been looking <laughs> for a pair of those. <laughs> So, okay, so guys, so yep. pull back on track. You guys okay. spending a ton of time out there. Yeah. I'm watching at home. I'm super convinced. Heck yeah. I want to get into this kind of thing. What do you, you all get approached by people, right? Like, I want to go back country skiing. What's, mm-hmm. what's first? Um, not, I don't want to get too avalanche yet. That's kind yeah, of yeah. getting there. But how do you encourage people to get into this? Do, do you take them? Do you, are there resources you guide people to? Like, what's a good first step for somebody? to do this safely and to really get the experience. In. I mean, absolutely. I feel like getting somebody out in a safe, controlled environment and also yeah. out of the gate, it's important to be like, Hey, if it's not good weather, we're not going to go like understanding right out of the gate, decisions need to be made every step of the way. Yeah. And therefore, like when you do get them out for that first time, like the goal for me, and I'm sure for you guys is like, have them have an experience that makes them coming back for more. Totally. Right. Yeah. And so if it's snowing or if it's, you know, low vis and, you know, Abby dangerous high, like there's a number of different variables that immediately shut things down right. and better yet, you know, you learn how to navigate a lot of those things. So, you know, like tomorrow morning, I'm supposed to go out early before sunrise with a friend who's a very fit person, not a, not a great skier and certainly doesn't know a lot about the backcountry or the avalanches. So my goal tomorrow is to literally find a walk in the woods that could progress based on decision making through those 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 hours of the day to to get on something that'll be aspirational. But if we right. find something along the way that says this doesn't sound good or doesn't seem good anymore, it's time to turn around. It's time to go find something else to do. I mean, I think that's a great point. For every time there's a picture right. guiding that turn, there's probably ten where you've turned back because mm-hmm. it wasn't safe for some reason. Right? Yep. There's conditions that are dangerous and you stay away from it. Um, but if you, so if if you're somebody that doesn't have that connection, if I don't know you and you're not going to take me out, um, I know like white pine touring does things. I, my perspective always is go with an expert several times. I mean, it's almost like when you go hunting, you can go out in the woods and it's probably safer, but you can be unsuccessful for years. But if you go with a guide and they can teach you things, you can learn fast. That's a huge start, right? I mean, well, but there's a reason like why, you know, it's Kaylin's got a lot of followers because she puts those pictures up there and we all aspire to do that, but everybody needs to learn how to layer, right? Like you have to be comfortable with your gear first. Then you have to be comfortable navigating your gear through, you know, the outside. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have to build up to take pictures like that, you know, and that's not something that comes overnight safely. Right. So, and there's a lot of like romantic, like people romanticize the backcountry, like someone like myself, you know, I, of course I'm posting, the highlights of the day, maybe not so much the thought process or the things that happened underneath it. Um, So maybe a little more clarity on that too. It'd be good to talk about, hey, we decided to turn around. We saw this, it looked beautiful. The photo would have been all time, but maybe it's not worth it, you know? And and I'm the first, I'm definitely very, very (laughs) cautious in the backcountry. It's it's just never worth it. Right. You know, it's just never worth it. I'd rather wake up the next day than be dealing with a major situation. But um, as you were saying, going out with someone that, that knows that's how I started, um, was going out with people that were really, really highly trained. So they knew what they were doing and we took it really easy, very minimal. Like looking back now, I, that was the most exhausting day of my life. And now I'm like, that's like <laughs> one of 10 laps, you know, it's nothing compared to, to how we function at the current moment. But, um, yeah, to go out with those people and just ease into it and, and just get a feel for it and get your feet wet and then just kind of progress from there. And getting the education, of course, is, is the big one behind it. I think we all jump into it, including myself, before the proper knowledge. Because it is exciting, and it is beautiful, and it's worth it. You want that fresh snow. But you have to realize there is a lot of consequences that comes with it. Mm-hmm. So getting the education, it doesn't take that long. It doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time. Getting that education, going with the right people, you're already setting yourself up for success. And so, actually, to tee up Craig, and I think you hit on it, like, when a lot of us started, there wasn't that much out there. You know, Utah Avalanche Center was just starting to really forecast digitally, um, probably about 10 years into my career out here, right? In the mid, you know, 2000s. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there was a lot of winging it going on. 
And there's a lot of people that paid the price and a lot of us were lucky in some regards. Uh, but nowadays there's so many more resources out there, you know, from expert guides to, you know, online resources from experts on a daily mm -hmm. basis. The they can help navigate that. I mean, I'd actually like to hear from Craig a little bit of the history of this because, you know, this is something that's really not just become, it was sort of niche when it started to me. Totally. Yeah. But yeah. all of a sudden, I mean, like, I feel like, you know, you're like the Walmart of the, uh, the backcountry forecasting <laughs> world, right? Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And, and let, let's, let's just track back for a moment or two. So, um, education is really huge, right? A guide is really huge. A mentor, somebody that you know, has got a lot of solid, solid knowledge um, and who's ingrained with avalanche avoidance, right? Avoiding closed calls, avoiding train wrecks, avoiding at the end of the day. Well, we had to piece all of these things together. That doesn't sound like a solid program to me. You know, so if that's how we are um, conditioned and that's how we're moving around throughout our day, there is a thin line uh, or a thin margin of error here. Mm -hmm. So eventually the odds are going to catch up. So to, to come full circle, I think a lot of us were winging it for a really long time, <laughs> myself included. And I know from my own personal perspective of connecting with people in the mid 80s who I thought had experience, <laughs> but really didn't. You know, yeah, they were really good skiers. They knew the resort really well. They, they were just getting into the backcountry. They were just getting their feet wet. But I looked up to them as mentors until one day, and it was early season, and it was similar to this. I was hiking um, up the, the ridge towards the shoulder of Baldy. And I was with my partner, and he said, right, and we had gear. We had, we had uh, avalanche beacons, shovels, probes. We never practiced with it, though. You know, it was like this was going to be our, our, our lucky thing that I was going to find my partner, you know. Just first try. Uh, first try ever, right? Just, yeah, this, this miraculous thing. And I remember this guy looking at me before we were going to descend on the shoulder of Baldy. He says, hey, we'll want to put, and, and it's storming, and it's blowing, and it's snowing. And he says, hey, we're going to want to put our hoods up for this. And I'm like, for what? He says, well, if we trigger and get caught in an avalanche, you know, you're going to want this around your head and you're going <laughs> to. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, well, this might happen. There's a good chance. And I'm like, so then why would we do it? I had enough common sense to say something isn't right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, you know, he kind of looked at me strange and the wind is blowing and you can hardly talk to the other person. I said, dude, if that's the case, I'm going to go the same way we came. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll just see you later, you know, and he looked at me like I was just a, an incredible ass for even <laughs> yes. like questioning him. And I'm so glad I did. And I'm so glad I pumped the brakes and nobody got hurt and nobody got killed. But two drainages over off of Sunset Peak that very same day, two guys died in an avalanche. And like I got back to my little crew plex on Wasatch Boulevard, and um, my, my roommates were like, oh my God, you're okay, you're okay. And I said, yeah, everything's fine. Well, you know that there was an avalanche in Big Cottonwood. And you know, I, didn't, I never put the pieces together, but it's like same day, same kind of terrain, same aspect elevation. It's like just by the grace of God and a little bit of common sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to kind of turn the corner. And, and it was sort of that initial um, initiation like, wow, I got to learn a little bit more about this. And when I became a ski patrolman and got more involved in snow and the interest in that, it really helped me to, to, yeah. to kind of turn the corner. And you're absolutely right, Billy. In the, in the 90s and early 2000s, man, we didn't have quite this big proliferation of avalanche information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And boy, there's some amazing things that we uh, love to hate about the internet, but education is one of the things we love to love about the internet. Yeah. Yeah. There's no excuse nowadays to just not, not at all not have any access to to any sort of education. Absolutely, you too. Yeah. And, and, and it, 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 it's an embarrassment of riches here, <laughs> yeah. right? I got to say, there's a reason that the UAC Utah mm -hmm. Avalanche Center is the flagship avalanche mm -hmm. center, not only here locally, nationally, but globally, intergalactically. I mean, it's amazing. We have all of this information, all of this content, and when we look. This is where avalanche research, education, outreach, this is where it has all taken root. So, I mean, 
It is such an honor. I've got such gratitude for being part of this organization for the past two decades. And they've done a really nice Great job point. of yeah. putting it online so you can yeah. find it. Anybody can Google this and find no before you go. Take that stuff as a starting point. And I totally. think what I'm hearing here, it's a little bit like say no to drugs. If you if you were like looking at this wow. going, I'm 50-50, that probably means you shouldn't do it, right? You shouldn't go out there unless you're confident, which kind of takes me back. Okay, if somebody's beginning, you know, one of the things I always tell people is, hey, they let you tour uphill on the resort in the mornings. Mm-hmm. Go to that and so you can switch your bindings out without a headlamp on, you know, test it in the snow. Without taking a your lot skis of times, off. It's oh, not even yeah. an avalanche. Like you're hiking right. up there and your binding pops off and you can't get your boot back on. You're burning calories and your adrenaline starts pumping. There's just so many aspects to this that take a lot of practice. So one of the questions we had was like, how much training do I have to do and how much? When I was mountain climbing, I was, I was, was told every step forward is like a contract. You can take that step back. Right. So it's always it's always two that you're committing to. Like you may be able to get up there, but if you can't get back, that was not the right decision. Right. And I think that it's a a slow buildup, you know, whether it's Garden Pass, hiking up there, if it's the resort. Um, you know, I took Dia, a friend out on his first day ski touring, he had blisters this big. We didn't go that far. But gosh, if you're by yourself and you run out there, blisters can stop you in your tracks. Totally. So, you know, what other tips would you have for people? Again, I'm trying to get this content together for somebody that doesn't have a contact or a friend, right? So, so where do they start? I mean, let's just talk about gear for a minute. People are probably like, how are you going uphill with skis? I mean, we might have people that don't even know about AT yeah. bindings, right? So you've got Telemark, you've got AT stuff, you've got kind of the hybrids like the shift you got bindings. split boards. you got split right? boards. Yeah. What do you guys like? What do you suggest for a beginner there? So, I mean, while we, we talk about the prof- proliferation of the sport, right? And it's busier for those of us that used to have it alone. The beautiful thing is the gear is totally progressed, right? Right. So now you can buy the same resort setup that you can take into the backcountry, right? It's not a side country setup. It's literally one that will do the whole range, right? you know? And so I think the first thing, like you said, it's all about layering and not just layering clothes, but layering gear. Like first, you got to get the gear. You got to make sure it fits. You got to make sure it's not going to blister, you got to ski it at the resort, get comfortable with it. Then you got to practice it in the backcountry. The backcountry could be a field behind your house. Like literally taking your skins off without taking your skis off right. is a huge, huge skill set to have in the backcountry for both like expediency, safety, etc. You know, and like every single layer along the way, like we built a whole skill set that, you know, took decades. But in retrospect, you know, we're all kind of like, oh, yeah, we can just do it all now. But for most people, it's like they want to be out there with us. I think they see what's happening at the highest level. And some people have earned it and learned it. And some people are just going for it. And I think the danger that, you know, I want to kind of warn to people is like, don't rush it. Like, enjoy every single step. Like, there's something exciting. Like, tomorrow might be a walk in the woods. It might be like snowshoeing right. with skis on. Right. You know, and, and that's something I'm at, you know, 30 years into my backcountry career, totally comfortable with, you know, like. If that's what tomorrow brings, that's what tomorrow brings. But I think to your point, it's like you really got to get the fundamentals down. So I would encourage people at home to to like spend the time on the Internet, learn about the gear, learn what's available to them. Think about what they would like to accomplish goal wise and then try to back it down into like what are the, the what's the first step? This is like going to the gym. You know, you don't just go ahead and bench press 400 pounds your first time out. You do what you can comfortably, safely, and then you build from there. And I would say it's like surfing. It's like you don't just go and catch a wave one day. You have to learn how to like paddle up past the break. You have to time the mm-hmm. wave. You have to be able to get up. You have to feel good on the line. Like there's yeah. a lot of steps before you actually get catch a wave. Yeah. And that's a very good analogy, I think, for what we're doing here. Um, I know you like to go ultra lightweight, right? So if you go look at Alpine Touring Gear, there's stuff that's super light. The downside to that is it's probably more flexible. It's a little harder to ski downhill, right? Like for it me. Is. I'm probably not as good of a skier. I've got kind of like a hybrid thing. So I've got a 130 flex ski boot with a walk mode, which to your point, I can use in resort and in the back country. I'm maybe a little compromised in the back country, but whatever, you know, it's, it's good enough. And then they have bindings today that will ski the resort just as good as, as off these. So mm-hmm. I always tell people, if you're going to go buy stuff, or you're going to rent stuff, rent that stuff. Cause it gives you as much mm-hmm. diversity. I mean, Kayla, what do you, what do you ski on? Like, what's your setup? Do you go ultra light? Do you kind of have a, one ski quiver? Or yeah, I typically like to go with the one ski quiver. So looking back to where I started, you know, I started with an Alpine setup with like, what is it, Daymakers? Like the, 
the oh frame binding. <laughs> yeah, 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 the, the things that you pop into your the binding. binding inserts, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so talk about the heaviest setup ever. But you know, it, it gradually progressed from there. Just between the fact that I became more and more invested and fell more in love with backcountry skiing um, and wanted to make it easier, better, lighter, faster, stronger. You know, you name it. And then, and then. Uh, and then gear has gotten so much better um, since, you know, 10 years ago when I was really starting to get into backcountry skiing yeah. that now I've, through trial and error, I have noticed that I just ski pretty much a tech binding with, uh, you know, a DinaFit backcountry boot that is perfectly fine for in resort. And I just ski that all the time. All the time. I did. I shot an ad for groomers on tech bindings, on pin bindings. Nice. And it was fine, you know, it was hilarious when you look at the, if you look really close, you're like, wait a minute, those aren't Alpine bindings, but um, it's just the gear is so good these days that you can do it. But what I, what I can say for people that are tiptoeing in to backcountry skiing or wanting to do it, um, as my dad said, buy it right or buy it twice. So buy once, cry once. Yes, yeah, that's so <laughs> exactly, maybe test some stuff, sure, that's fair. Um, see what you like, but it's worth the investment. It might be a little more expensive, but if you get the right bindings, if you get the right boots, especially the boots, backcountry boots are so good these days that you get the right ones. I guarantee you, you'll ski those in resort and out of resort and you'll be totally. super happy instead of having to jump back and forth, but just make the investment. I'm with you. I use a walk mode, 130 flex boot. It's not ultralight mm -hmm. like Billy. I'm a bigger guy. I don't think I really feel the grams, yeah. uh, but, but like, Craig, tell me about what, what your setup is, because you're doing a lot of different stuff than we are. You're probably touring more than you are skiing, right? When you're checking out avalanches and everything yeah, else. Yeah, all of the above. I mean, I, I love to walk uphill, but I like skiing downhill as well. But my gear um, might be a little bit uh, removed from modern technology. So I like gear from the last millennium, and that really works well for me. So I ski with a pair of bindings that were made in the 90s that are really hard to get parts for. I ski with a pair of those t races, 97 <laughs> or so. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I just, I just kind of put things together. But your surf analogy, right? Here's the difference between snow and the ocean. The ocean lets you know exactly who the boss is right out of the gates. Yeah, that's good I point. mean, just to paddle out, right? You get your ass kicked, right? So totally. you realize like, wow, I am in way over my head. However, with snow, with avalanches, and particularly with the back Looks country, so peaceful. Oh man, it's awesome, right, Kaylin? You nailed it. It is like for these shots that, that you go out and you do, right? Mm -hmm. You just see the premier this is the IG post, you know, or you just see the premiere post in a backcountry magazine. But what about everything that it took to get there? So snow is super resilient. Mm -hmm. It allows us to get away with a lot of mistakes, sometimes for a season, sometimes for several seasons, sometimes for a lifetime, until it decides that all the elements come together and it's like, that's it. It's all good until it isn't. Yeah, finicky. It's super <laughs> finicky, but we can be out there, and we talked about this, Billy and Kaylin, like you can be out there doing this every single day. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of getting all of this knowledge under your belt, mm -hmm. um, getting a solid crew that you travel with, people that you trust, and then not always being on that margin of error. So the beauty right now is like, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was a suffer fest every time you went out. Because we're skiing on skis this wide and like, you know, you've got the support of boots like my running shoes, you know, so like you had to be really good before you even got into avalanche terrain because the steepness of your driveway looked like Mount Everest to begin with, right? <laughs> right. So to get into avalanche terrain, it was like you were, you know, a couple years into that, not if not a decade. Um, now, though, man, like right out of the gates, you know, you're talking tech gear that you can easily go from chairlift riding in the morning mm -hmm. to, you know, putting your skins on and bagging some peaks in the afternoon. And again, the snow doesn't know that you're a really ripping skier. You know, it only knows that like, you're good at skiing, but your avalanche knowledge never quite keeps up with your mm -hmm. ski knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, a little bit of a difference. The two skills you have to have kind of equal. They gotta be pretty yeah, equal. Ski resorts yeah. all the time. You can probably go tour back and get yourself in trouble. It's almost like, e-bikes in park city right you see people now riding way further back than they ever should and now they're like how do i get down 
you yeah. know, or their battery dies. They don't have the physical fitness to get themselves back. Mm-hmm. Damn, I that mean, battery. Damn. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm thinking of one time, Billy, last winter, I don't know if you remember this, we were snowmobiling, and we were coming out of, uh, we were at Smith Morehouse, we are coming out, and you were like, should we go take the ridge back? And I was like, I, we don't know what it's like, and so we decided to take the trail back. And that day, there was a huge slide, a couple drainages over, that video Lewis of that guy. Peak. Lewis yeah, Peak. Yeah, with those guys all, I mean... You just never know, right? Yeah. But we talk about having a team you go with and having somebody you trust. It's like, you got to check each other, you know? Yeah. I think that day you were like, let's go for it. And I was like, let's just get out of here. And then there's other times where it's probably reversed, right? Where I'm like, let's do this. And you're like, that is stupid, Look, man. I really want to so, hear what these guys put in their packs. Yeah. But I also like to reiterate what you said. I think the biggest key that you can send to anybody who's looking to get into this backcountry, whether it's on a sled, on skis, no matter what, it's all about the people you surround yourself with yeah. and the ability to make smart decisions. Mm-hmm. Right. Because over the long term, that's going to be the difference to keep you out of trouble. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, before we get into the gear and the packs, start from the base up. You know, one of the things I think about too is a lot of people have their like resort skiing gear, like mm-hmm. insulated jackets and whatnot. Um, as, as we know, layering is critical when you're sweating and then you're freezing and then you're sweating. So how do you guys think about layering? Like when you look at the forecast in the morning, tell me like what you wear, what you bring with, how you think about layering. I have a, I'm sure we all have a slightly different perspective based on how much we sweat, mm-hmm. how active we're going to be. But how do you think about that? I mean, <laughs> who, wants, who wants to feel that? Yeah. How do I think about that? Yeah, uh, again, um, so when it comes to anything with gear for me, it's invest in the proper gear because yeah. uh, you'll have it forever and it'll be super functional. Um, but, you know, the big ones are... I really don't, I like to keep to as much natural gear as I can. So merinos and downs versus synthetic materials. I've just personally have found they work a lot better. Um, but they don't yeah. smell either. Like, that too. People don't that's realize true. this merino just, oh, that's yeah. why you hunters use it because yeah. you don't have a scent where you buy some kind of synthetic base layer and like two days later you're like, is that me? Dude, I, I have like an emotion in like a in synthetic layer and I stink immediately. Like it's just like, it, it's so bad. But yeah, getting just those really high quality, you don't need a lot of them. But if you just have a couple good options, um, you know, for me, it's it's a lightweight, you know, merino layer, a midweight of some sort, um, and then a down, no matter what. Midweight, are you talking like a small puffy? Are you talking a fleece? Are you talking, what are you talking about? There? Yeah, so like a midweight layer would be, sometimes you can find like hybrid versions. So you've got merino with some down inserts or some like slightly thicker areas, like a zip up. A lot of times it's a zip up of some sort, so you can take it on and off really easily. So it's a little heavier than like a simple, simple base layer, but it's not a puffy jacket or, you know, your, your top layer. Um, and those come with me usually, but worst case scenario, as long as I have a good base layer and a really good puffy jacket, I'm pretty happy for the most part. And then of course your shell uh, for skiing. And then you're usually good to go, but 100%, no matter what, even on the warmest day, that puffy jacket comes with me. It's for a sure. little down thing. It's like this, it's like a baseball. You, it always comes with you, no matter what. Because mm-hmm. you never know. You never yeah. know what might happen. Right. I mean, you could you could come across someone who doesn't have it, who's has hypothermia for all you know. You could put it on them. I mean, I've rescued people out of the backcountry before where our puffy jackets saved their lives. It's an instant warmth, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, puppies are awesome. For no way you know, if you're wet, yeah. you're never cold. You're never warm. You're mm-hmm. always going to be cold, right? Yeah. right? So cotton kills. You're talking about like a blend yes. merino mm-hmm. puffy. That's my favorite. I have a black mm-hmm. diamond piece. The back is all merino because mm-hmm. usually your moisture's coming out the back, right? If you're mm-hmm. moving forward with that wind coming around, you got puffy in the front. Yeah. And man, you've just got to get that moisture out. Yeah. It's it's so critical, especially when you're touring the backcountry and you're up high. Yeah. It's a hard workout. I mean, you burn thousands of calories over, over several miles. And you so. nailed it. I mean, it's something as simple as like, I had, don't wear cotton. I mean, I used to, like I had my little tall tee right. thing when I was like 18, like waddling around, just sweating and, and you see it. But yeah, it's something as basic as like, don't bring cottons, just invest in those good merino, you know, or synthetic if you need to. Uh, layers it makes a big difference there's a reason why they exist you do make an exception to skiing jeans occasionally though right you know okay. <laughs> in the springtime the jorts come out the jorts do come so out so let's make that <laughs> distinction right sorry jeans on occasion guys jeans on that occasion that is the exception <laughs> but you're in the back country all the time you're wearing yeah. kind of what you have on right now right I mean yeah. pretty you much got a uniform. couple layers on yeah. you can quickly change based on if the sun comes out or a snow squall comes in or I'm going to be four hours longer totally right Yeah. and you just you just are layering you're not buying one one big 
you know, Canada goose jacket that's like insulation covered with waterproof. Like that's the wrong answer, right? The, the one piece Bogner only comes out in the spring, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's like, you know what? I like going light and fast. Right. So um, definitely I take your uh, suggestion under advisement. The puffy always goes with, but um, you know, hiking uphill, breaking trail. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys know, I mean, you're burning a lot of calories a lot of heat um, for uh, a, a fairly thin guy. Um, man, I, I've got a therm thermostat that runs really hot. I'm the same. So yeah, I can. Eat, I, I I rarely, if ever, wear a hat just because I overheat so much. And so pit zips are open and convertibles down most mm -hmm. of the time. I always tell people start cold. Right? Oh yeah, you yeah. don't want to get a truck cool, super cool warm. and dry. Cool and dry, man. Hot, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Don't be afraid to start cold. Make sure you're all like when we're hunting, it's like every 10 or 15 minutes, we're thinking about our layers. We change sure, our socks. Sure. Do we, I, I think, th I think it's notable to say like, you know, to your point, like the most important thing in addition to what you bring is trying to maintain like that, that non sweat state where even if you're getting hot, you're immediately peeling, right? Yeah. Peel down yeah. to that Merino base layer. And then, you know, if you get to the top or something changes weather wise, then you layer up. But like if the more you can avoid sweating in particular, like the longer you can be out yeah. and the safer you can be. Yeah. So if we're sweating and we're burning, that means we're burning calories, right? Like what do you guys what do you guys take for food in the backcountry? Real food. What's your favorite what's your favorite <laughs> stuff? Hey, look, I was a professional bike racer for a long time. So I've had way too much sports drink and way too many, you know, energy bars and right. things like that. So especially with backcountry and the speed of backcountry. Like I love peanut butter and jelly, tortilla, sandwich, whatever, something you can pack up, collapse. And when it's done, you know, the wrapper essentially is just a piece of saran wrap or tin foil, wadded up, stick in the bag, but you know, high calorie, good tasting, something that's appealing to keep eating, Right. you know, not something yeah. you have to choke down or need a lot of water for. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it depends on the day too. If it's a big mission, big day where you got to go light, then it's more functional foods. You know, your bars, stuff that low weight, high calorie, high fat. Um, but if it's maybe more of a fun skiing day, like more of a bougie day, doing laps, whatever, then meat and salami, like whiskey. salami, yeah, whiskey, schnapps, <laughs> schnapps. So I always bring, yeah, I bring some peppermint schnapps called Uller. And then uh, I love my salami and I love my cheese. And yeah. that, that comes in the pack. And those, those are super yeah. caloric foods oh, too. Yeah. So if it's a long day, you've got more time to break those down. And yeah. that's actually, you know, one of the things we were, when I was mountain climbing, I was like Snickers bars because you've got sugar, you've got nuts, you have all these different mm -hmm. fuel sources that burn at different rates, mm -hmm. which gives you a sustained Sour Patch Kids. Soon burned, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, people are always eating you know, gummies or whatever. Yeah, you don't need to go get the fancy gummies. Just go right. to the bulk aisle, get some Sour Patch Kids, and just load it up. It does the same thing. <laughs> well, Billy mentioned, you know, eat what you like, but also eat what your body's used to digesting. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend the first day out, oh, I'm going to grab some goos. I've never had these before because mm, you're going to have stomach issues. And I'll tell you, that's not very fun. You're not right. slope either. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and it's like the clothes. Bring more than you need. Right. Like you should right. always come home with like dry clothes and extra, extra food in your food. pack unless yeah. something went wrong. And water. Mm -hmm. And water. How do you guys think about water out there? Lots of it. Hardly an hour. How do you keep it from freezing? <laughs> How do you guys think about that? So I keep, I always make sure I have the insulated strip on my camelback. I, mean, I prefer camelbacks because then I drink more frequently, which is literally like, you know, you've been out with me like every 10, 15 minutes, just yep. a little sip while we make our next decision about where we want to go. Um, but yeah, the insulated strip makes it really nice. I've got a pack now and then actually I bought it used, but you know, it zips into that as well. And then if I'm having any issues at all, I'll actually put my pack on underneath a jacket just to Keep the thaw it back out. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, those bite valves sometimes freeze up, yep. especially if you've used them in really cold temperatures a few times in a row. Do you guys all use camelbacks? I use no, bottles. I yeah. I like knowing Insul how much insulated I'm bottles. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I just, it doesn't leak. I've had Camelbacks leak on me and then it's like you're half up a hill and everything's wet in the box. So, I mean, that's, I know they're a successful product. I think it's kind of dealer's choice there, but yeah. how do you guys think about that? I definitely drink more when I do have a Camelback for sure. Right. But I, at the same time, I like to know where my water's at. So I just bring an insulated bottle. It's not like the lightest option, but it works. And then on top of that, um, hot tea. That was a great one. Um, Christina Lusenberger, she had a bunch of hot tea when we were out skiing and freezing. Yeah. And she busted out like 
like hot apple tea. And I was like, this is the best. And you're drinking water. It's so good. Like hot tea is the best. Oh, hot tea <laughs> on a cold day. That is mm -hmm. awesome, isn't it? It's yeah, the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'll speak uh, to some of our plant-based brethren and sistren <laughs> because that's what I am, right? right. So uh, lots of water. And then, you know, I do the, the goo shots because that sort of keeps me going. I like a focused zen when I'm out in the backcountry and when I'm looking at snow, when I'm skiing. So I go kind of light. And so that means nuts. I've got an apricot tree in my backyard. We dehydrate apricots. So that's sort of my mix. We make our own homemade uh, bars. Um, and that's sort of what fuels me throughout the day. When I get back to my rig though, I totally chow down on my drive home. But I like to be kind of light and in tune and in touch with everything. I do agree when, I, when I'm when i feeling light, eating light, I just feel like I'm clearer. Clear. I mean, obviously you eat, blood goes to your stomach and that's blood you can't use to mm -hmm. clean out your lactic acid in your legs or whatever. So there is a good balance there. That probably comes with just experience too, right? Everybody it's, here it's knows. It's your own jam. Figure yeah, it yeah. Out, yeah. What, what works for you works for you for sure. So again, start yeah. slow, figure it out, yeah. build up. Yeah just, exactly. yeah, just don't bring anything silly. Just bring stuff that's quick, functional, you can pop in your mouth, you know, right, it's right. not massive preparation or anything like that. And another good one is always having water and maybe some sort of food at your car when totally. you get back. That always is... have water and food in your car. You I never think about know. about elk hunting, if you're carrying an elk out, <laughs> you're burning calories, you probably eat all your food. Having stuff back in your truck is yes. like super critical. So I've always got a cooler with water and like peanut M&Ms, beef jerky, mm -hmm. just stuff to really, yeah. to get you back in the game fast. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Maybe oh. your car won't start, you never know. <laughs> That's a good point. Too. Well, at least for me. I thought I'd give you a peanut. I thought we had that own Oh, no, that's true. Now I'm good to go. <laughs> um, we had a question about starting fires when things are wet. So let's say you're out there and you're stuck for a while and starting a fire. Um, I've got some ideas around that. I'd love to hear yours. So any, any tips to somebody? It's like, okay, we're going to be here for a minute. Maybe for whatever reason, somebody's bonking. They need a couple hours or the stuff's wet. They need to dry out. What do you guys do there? Like, how do you approach that? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, kind of doing the hybrid thing with the sled, right? The beauty of that is like you can pack on um, some extra pounds as far as what you're carrying. So I tend like if I'm doing a U winter day uh, and it's going to be a big day, you know, I'm going to have some extra things on my sled, um, in the bags on my sled. That, yeah, if something goes sideways, I'm going to be able to start a fire. I'm going to be able to gather some dry wood. I could use a little bit of gas out of the tank. I mean, if all if everything goes That's sideways, right? Too, it's just getting some gas out of the tank. Yeah, and, and if everything goes sideways, I'm going to torch that sled <laughs> before my, my buddy's going to freeze to death, right? right? So that's the beauty of that. The double-edged sword, though, is especially for hybrid users, is getting deeper and deeper into the backcountry. Yeah. And if we are able to get out on our own physical power and accord, that tends to kind of put, pump the brakes on us a little bit more than if you've just got a fistful of throttle and before you know it, you're 30 miles into the backcountry. Right. So definitely kind of use a little buffer and use a little bit of barometer on that. But um, I, again, like to surround myself with experienced people, right. people that I know if things do kind of come off the rails, then, you know, my partner's got my back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And over, you know, over the years, I've also, you know, packed for the bad, not the good. And a lot of people, including myself at one point was like, oh, I've got my beacon probe shovel and, you know, maybe an extra layer in my snacks. Good to go. And <laughs> right. we're a little bit spoiled here in the mall set because we pretty much have so cell close, service right? most of the places. Right. It's not that hard. You're close to the road. Um, but then when I started doing more backcountry skiing outside of Utah, where the access is, you got a snowmobile 10 plus miles in, you have to do this. And if anything goes wrong, you're really out there. Your rescue will not come for a long time. And so being prepared for that. So I saw, you know, now I pack, I pack a little jet boil. I, we saved someone's life because we were able to feed him hot water, boiling water, like to keep him warm while we waited for 12 hours for a rescue to come, wow. you know, but the, just having that heat was huge. So that having, you know, tools on hand to fix your bindings, having wire, having zip ties, these other little things besides just your first aid kit makes a huge difference. Um, I bring little cotton balls that are doused in, in gasoline so you can start a fire super easy. Perfect. Just little things. It might add a few more pounds to your pack, but it will save your life. And so don't just pack for the day out for skiing, but pack for survival. Yeah, that's a great tip because I think a lot of times you hope not to use everything in your pack, right? Yes. But, yeah. but man, if you need it and it's there, it's life or death. 
Uh, one of the tricks I learned this last year in Alaska, my guide would take a bundle of, we were just, it was wet for weeks. He'd take a jet oil, get it going. Mm -hmm. He'd just hold it under a bundle of fire and that would smoke for two minutes. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, it'd dry out and it would start on fire. Yep. So just a, those jet oils are tiny. I mean, they're yeah. like a third the size of the gas canister. Yeah. Sorry, when you say a bundle, you're talking about like the, the under branches of like a pine tree or? Yeah, I mean, at this point we were gathering whatever wood we could find. I yeah. mean, yeah, usually you can go under a pine tree, you can find dry you get stuff. like that stuff that's like really thin, you kind of ball it together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, you, you can usually find dry stuff. Where we were, I'm sure, I'm sure so anybody much. watching this right now is like, man, you guys are going to like calculus and back. You know, like, <laughs> you know that's, that's the problem with like people that have had a lot of experience. And that's why I think it's so important to rem remind everybody like, you got to layer on, you know, like right. every right. single category we're talking about, whether it's clothes, food, gear, whatever, like each one, you know, is like a lifelong learning experience and you're putting them all together in the backcountry. And oh, I think that's yeah. like the crux move that like makes it that aspirational, but also that dangerous. Totally. Totally. I mean, you were talking about zip ties and, and wire. I mean, we built a little triage kit mm -hmm. with those things in it because a yeah. lot of times if gear breaks, that's the first step in, and that but like things happening, right? Yeah. You know, like how many times have like I've, I have like how many year old duct tape wrapped around shovel handles and right. water bottles and you know like everything has almost a second purpose that you bring, you know. Right. Whether it's just something that's along for the ride, or in the event that you need to, you know, fix something on your snowmobile or repair ski binding, like mm -hmm. you've got tie wire. You know, I use old clothes hangers for. I've got a pair of skins that have held up under an old clothes hanger, twisted around the tips for. I don't even know, 15 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. And I still, it's like the, the pair I give to my friends. And if, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. they're not happy, I'll use them. It's fine. Right. Yep. right. Do you guys bring extra gloves, extra hats, extra layers? Absolutely. Like that? When sure, we talked yeah. about layering, I like, I think you guys were all on the same page, right? You know, you got like your Merino or whatever base layer that's not going to get cold when it's wet. But then, you know, you're layering up with a shell and a puffy. But the most important thing is having like that extra base layer in your pack for the top, at least I usually bring a pair of uh, puffy pants for the bottoms. Cause if, if you end up getting holed up somewhere or somebody needs to spend the night because they broke their leg or whatever, like those puffy pants, that extra down jacket, like all those things come in handy, yeah. but wool socks, just having a dry pair of wool socks that does two things. You know, one, you put them on, if your feet get wet or you're cold, you need to layer up. Number two, you ever need like ski crampons and you didn't bring them? You tie those things up into a knot, roll them onto the bottom of your ski right in front of the binding, and all nice. of a sudden you got ski crampons. Yeah, you nice. know. Yeah, uh, but gloves and a hat for sure. Like, yeah, I keep. I don't want to say half a dozen pairs of gloves in my truck in the winter, but probably three or four. <laughs> yeah, because they're always like, they come. I come down and they're wet, so I put my gloves in like you know in the yep. the windshield where the, the heat's coming out. I put dry ones back in the kit, and man. I, one of my things is like warm hands, because if you lose your dexterity, your fingers are wet, yeah. that just starts to compromise everything, your feet and your hands. So yeah. I'm always changing those out, not trying to get them too wet. So if they start getting a little wet, you know, in the snowmobile, you can pop that thing up where the exhaust comes out and shove them in and let them dry a little. Yeah. But once they're kind of that, past that point of no return, it's, it's tough. Yeah. yeah and then, then you're getting cold and then you're cold. Nobody likes that. Yeah. 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 And I'm, and I'm with you on that. Like I don't technically bring a lot of like extra layers, like the stuff that I have on and I'm just really cautious. Um, you never know things do happen, but, um, so I, I wouldn't say I have a ton of extra long sleeves or anything like that, but always I have a like, touring gloves and I have my ski gloves. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, they are yeah. two different beasts. Cause that's the biggest one. These are just things that I learned, you know, having two sets of gloves an extra hat an extra neck gaiter is like, those are, if I have to bring extras, those are the first three right. that I hit. Yeah. Sure. I actually found a new product last year and it's a company from Germany called Rokel, but hmm. I think there's, I've seen other ones. I think Black Diamond and some other folks make them, but they're basically just like a super lightweight, highly densible, packable, like down over mitt mm -hmm. that you can hmm. throw a set of gloves in. They're almost like, you know, just like the oh shit pack, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, if everything else is going wrong, you can throw these on top. You've just added a ton of R value. You can get through anything. So yeah. that's the extra pair I keep in my pack at all times. Usually when you and I are out all day though, it's like, especially with hand warmers on snowmobiles, you'll sweat through a pair of gloves just on those. So right? fast. Totally. So yeah. Fast. yeah. 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 It's miserable and you can't hold on. And yeah. yeah. And you switch to skiing and all of a sudden you forget that, <laughs> you know, right. Um, you know, we didn't really talk about Abbey beacons, probes, shovels. I was talking to somebody last year and they were going to go to the backcountry and like, well, I've got a beacon on, so I'm good. And I'm like, we talked to this earlier. If you don't know how to use those things, like if you're actually using that, you've made 
a bunch of errors to begin with, or had some bad things happen, right? I yeah. mean, that's a last resort is having to use a shovel or a probe or a beacon. Um, can you touch a little bit on know before you go and maybe, because I think that's the right place to start when it comes to, to that kind of stuff. Right? Right. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so just getting some basic AVI awareness under your belt, right? And you, we, we've all sort of hit on this point. We're going to be prepared. We're going to have all of this gear. If we've got to use any of that stuff, it, it sort of means that we've screwed up in some regard, right. particularly with avalanche rescue gear. Right, because we want to be well versed in all of that. But if we've got to use a beacon shovel probe to find our partner, we have, we have screwed up massively. And what we'll realize is that a quarter of us are killed by trauma right out of the gates. So for the rest of us, like to even have a really well articulated rescue with a success rate at the end of the day, I mean, at the very minimum, our partner is gonna be cold. Mm -hmm. They might be hypothermic. They might have a blown out knee. They might have an injured shoulder. Now what? Now how do we put all of the pieces mm -hmm. together? So let's keep this super, super simple. We gotta have the gear. We gotta know how to use it, but avoidance is the big ticket. Right, 100%. Right, so does that make sense? So. Where do we start? Maybe before you go, I mean, it, it is sort of like, it, it, it is the go-to basic AVI awareness class, not only here nationally, but globally, right? So we know that, that's accepted practice. Get some of that basic AVI awareness underneath your belt. And then again, start to progress into a, a basic on the snow class. You know, get to see what, just like we've all been talking about, what it feels like to move around on the snow, what it's like just to put skins on, to get up to a certain destination and take those skins off. And then, you know, if you're not so exhausted, you can actually ski down and you can enjoy this thing. So putting all of those pieces of the, of the puzzle together. The beauty of our environment and this educational environment right now is that there are so many resources. Uh, yeah. You know, you don't have to figure this out by yourself. So getting a guide, getting the proper education, surrounding yourself with um, equally experienced people that you've got a good groove going on, but then some mentors and some avenues that you can pursue this. We have this amazing opportunity, this amazing environment in our backyard. So take advantage of it, but do it in a smart fashion. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of lot of places. Every resort, or at least most resorts, offer some sort of avalanche training. Sure, you sure. know, whether it's certified or not. But they're they're gonna offer some training. You know, Alta, they bury beacons. Um, right. they have like a little little search place that you can go to, and a lot of resorts have that. Or you can do it with your friends. We used to do grocery store beacon searches. So one person runs in, hides a beacon somewhere in the grocery store, and then we all go in and we go find one. There's ways to, you know, to teach yourself, even if you don't have access to something as nice as we do here in Utah. Sure. Um, uh, online, you name it. But definitely take an avalanche course. It's amazing what we don't know. <laughs> yeah. And then on top of that, if you can, whether it's a wilderness first aid or a woofer, so wilderness first responder course, either one of those, the first aid's a little shorter, take those because that, as Craig was saying, just because an avalanche, you know how to rescue your buddy, what are you gonna do if they're injured beyond right. just you know the berry? And knowing how to handle that comes with those courses and that training. And you know, no matter how good you are, no matter how savvy you are, you need the training. For sure. It doesn't yeah. matter who you are. No. So I think what I'm hearing to wrap this up a little bit, start small. Mm -hmm. Find an expert, whether it's a friend or an organization. Don't ever go beyond what you're 100% sure of. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I think everybody's different. So you have to learn what works best for you. There's not like a, here's a spreadsheet, get all these things in your dial. It's, it's kind of figured on your own, right? Is there anything yep. you guys would add to that or is that... Is that good? I think you summarized it well. Like you can't carry it all. So what right. you have to do is think about what do you need and what could you need? Right. And then try to like figure out what could, you know, maybe serve a couple purposes and bring the minimal amount that you feel very well covered with. That's on a higher level though. I think going back to where we all feel like you should start, it's like, you know, think before you go, know before you go layer knowledge one on, on the next. If you yep. don't know how to eat, if you don't know how to dress, if you don't know how to ski, if you don't know how the gear works, like all of those boxes need to be checked before you take the next step. Yeah. And for me, you know, on top of what you just said is leave the ego at the door, leave it at the car. Yeah. That run will always be there no matter what. The earth will be around a lot longer than we will. So and there's, there's a lot of fun to be had in really safe zones too. Yeah. I mean, you can tour up 
in the mornings on the resort. You know, there's no Abbey Danger there. They've groomed it, right? So maybe right. you get a day where yeah. they groomed and it snowed a foot. And if you get up early and get first tracks, you're kind of getting all the benefit, none of the risk. Start there, get comfortable, right? Yep. So simplify the complex, man. Nice. That's what we got to do with all of this. Sounds good. You should make a shirt. <laughs>